Well, that was fun. What better song to start a day like today than Heavenly Sunlight? I have it on good authority that the sun is shining. Somewhere. It's shining here, too. There's just stuff between us. We can't see it. I'm glad to welcome you to our worship service this morning. Thank you for braving yet another Sunday snowstorm. And uh, I am really excited today because I have it on good authority that my oldest son, Darren, and his wife, Katrina, and my youngest son, Matthew, and his friend, Elizabeth, and my grandsons, Eli and William, might be watching live this morning. So, Pop says hi. I don't know if they're up yet. If they are, they're watching in their pajamas, but that's all right. That's the nice thing about being able to watch church from home, right? What's, what, but what you miss is the warm fellowship of being here together. So I'm glad that you're here this morning, and thank you for not staying in your pajamas. If you are um, a guest here this morning, would you just um, uh, tear off that uh, registration from the bulletin, put your name and address on there, and drop it in the offering plate when it's passed later? so that we have a record of your visit. We'd like to send you a letter uh, thanking you for joining us in worship and uh, perhaps something about our church that would help you get better acquainted. We'll appreciate that if you drop that in the bulletin. Just a couple of uh, announcements that I want to highlight. Uh, most of you know that I was planning to leave after church today to drive down to New York to arrange for our furniture and things to be shipped up here. Um, watching the weather, it's not going to get better until late this afternoon or tonight, so I think probably I will wait and go in the morning. I know you're concerned about that, uh, so thank you for your encouragement, thank you for your prayer, uh, and it uh, looks like almost certainly I will wait and go tomorrow morning. But I will be back next Sunday. And uh, there are some things that are happening this week. Because I'm away, the Wednesday Bible studies morning and evening will not meet this week. The bulletin says the Thursday morning Bible study will not meet. Uh, but but uh, the, the men who are part of the Thursday Bible study will decide that. that. That is still not certain. The men who are attending that Thursday morning Bible study may decide to go ahead and meet Thursday Anyway, there was no hard decision made about that on Thursday, so uh, if that involves you men, uh, we did not take that privilege away from you. You're welcome to make that choice for yourselves. And there is a senior supper Thursday at 5, and I know you're excited about that. I'm sad to miss that, uh, but uh, be sure to let your friends know that that is on. Wednesday is the 4th in the series of Lenten luncheons here in the community. And uh, each of the last three Wednesdays, the attendance has grown. Uh, we hosted here uh, on Wednesday, and so far, uh, th this last Wednesday was the largest attendance, no doubt because of so much good support from you. But I won't be here this Thursday. So I hereby deputize you. All of you are hereby deputized to represent First Baptist Church at the Lenten Luncheon this Wednesday at noon. Uh, it will be hosted at the Holton United Methodist Church. And please be there and represent uh, our little congregation uh, so that people won't talk about us when we're not there. I'm kidding about that. I do welcome those who are joining us uh, over the internet, both live and later in the recorded version. Uh, we're glad that you're here this morning to worship with us, and uh, we'd like to begin our worship this morning by taking our hymnals and turning, please, to number 74. <clears throat> we're going to sing the, the chorus majesty all the way through once, and then we're going to repeat from where it says, so exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. You'll know it when we come to it. Let's all stand together and lift our voices in this great song of praise.
Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we stand in the presence of a great God by your Holy Spirit present in this room right now, in this sanctuary, this house named for you. And we declare, we exalt, we lift up the name of Jesus, and we honor and glorify that precious name that is above every name. It is our desire this morning that we should exalt the name of Jesus Christ, by whom we have the forgiveness of sin, through whom we have the gift of eternal life, salvation, through whom we have been granted access into your throne room of grace, that we might come boldly and find help and mercy in our time of need. We thank you, our Father, for each one who has joined together in this place in worship this morning. And those who will join us uh, in their living rooms and in their homes and in their cars as they listen and join in our worship, we exalt the name of Jesus Christ today. From every place on earth, may Jesus Christ be praised. And now, our Father, we pray as the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. This time we're going to have our missions moment. I'm looking to see. Thank you. Up in front of her own TV this morning. Um, and so I will remind you that this is the month for the America for Christ offering, and this is the offering which all stays in our country. And it's very important. Our goal is $700. As you can see from the bulletin, we have $467. We have one more Sunday to uh, ask for your offering. We're not going to ask you for an offering on Palm Sunday, which, would you believe, is two Sundays mm. from now. But please remember this offering, the, the envelopes are in the pews in front of you, and here's a video about it. I believe that inside each one of us are the seeds to our own healing, and we need that to be nurtured and allowed to grow and blossom. In the peaceful pine forests of Arizona's Rim Country, children and families come together at a biannual weekend bereavement camp to grieve the loss of loved ones. The ministry, which began more than 10 years ago, is run by the Reverend Cindy Darby, an American Baptist hospice chaplain endorsed by American Baptist Home Mission Societies. This camp shares God's grace by showing compassion and understanding, by reaching out to those who are hurting. Camp activities build relationships of trust so participants feel safe to share feelings of sadness. During adult support groups, children participate separately in specially designed activities that set the stage for sharing grief in their different ways. My children often work out their grief through their play, and they need something physical to do as they're working through those painful emotions. At the camp, we provide a lot of opportunity for them to run around and kick soccer balls and throw frisbees, and also crafts that involve them doing something in honor of the person who died. The best thing is just watching the transformation of the children and the families throughout the weekend and how the healing process has already started in a very short amount of time. 
They start to share emotions. And the most importantly, they realize that they're not alone. Coming out here and being able to talk about my feelings really, really helped me in a sense that everybody understood what I was going through because they're going through the same things. We are speaking heart to heart. That's what makes it safe. It's the language of love, I believe, that I've received here, and I think everyone has received here. At first, I was a little hesitant, um, maybe because I'm a man, and um, actually happened to come to grips with grief and loss, but I found that it was probably the best thing I could have ever done. It's helping me realize that loss is part of life, how to process it, how not to get stuck, it's just life. What it means to me is that you are not alone. For me, this weekend has been transformational. It really has. And I am forever grateful and thankful. American Baptist Home Mission Societies endorses more than 600 chaplains like the Reverend Cindy Darby, who work in specialized ministry settings, nursing homes, prisons, hospitals, and military locations across the globe. These men and women minister to thousands of wounded souls searching for transformational grace and healing. Your America for Christ offering gifts assure they will find it. There's a human being worthy of love, one of God's children that needs help, that needs ministry, that needs kindness. I believe that we are called to help our neighbor, to help that person in need. Please, please give generously. Your gift to the America for Christ offering will help support uh, those more than 600 American Baptist chaplains working uh, in all of those places, as well as the other things that the America for Christ offering supports. And I do thank you for your faithful support. I have some updates uh, on our prayer list, on the list that uh, is there in your bulletin, a couple of updates and things that have been given to me as additions. Uh, so if you want to make uh, some notes, there's room, there's some blank lines on both sides. Uh, first, uh, we've learned that Shirley Strout is home from the hospital. Uh, though she still is in need of our prayer, she is no longer at St. Joseph's Hospital. We have a, a note of praise, Joe Hughes' friend Paul, who we prayed for, who had suffered a spinal stroke. And uh, doctors didn't have much hope that he would ever walk again just 10 days ago is now walking with a cane. So we praise the Lord for that answer to prayer, and we pray that this might be one of those progressive miracles that uh, soon he won't need the cane at all. Uh, Janice and Mike Kelly are driving home from Portland, uh, perhaps today, so let's pray for their safety. Uh, and Michael Rarden and his brother are taking their mother to Bangor tomorrow for, for a checkup. And let's pray for their safety. And uh, then uh, Paul, McGill <laughs> Paul McGillicuddy is celebrating his 102nd birthday tomorrow. That's amazing. Now, um, perhaps you have some things to add as well. Are there, are there any uh, additions quickly to our prayer list? devastation of the typhoon in the Pacific Ocean? Is there something else? Yes, the uh, uh, soldiers and Marines who were killed this week in that helicopter crash. Let's pray together. We are grateful, Father, as I prayed earlier, that we have been given access, permission, and invitation to come boldly before the throne of grace so that we might find help and mercy in our time of need. We continue, Father, to pray for those uh, who are uh, dear to us and, and are on our hearts. We pray this morning again for Emily and Donna and their families. 
We do lift up Tom Good, Father. We continue to pray for your hand of healing to be on him. Uh, he has had a difficult week, and uh, we just pray that you would graciously sustain him and raise him up. We pray for Tom McAfee and uh, for Randy Henderson, Lord. We thank you for Shirley Strout being at home now out of the hospital, but we pray for her continued strength and, and healing. We thank you, Father, for the progress that George Duff is making in the hospital. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you'll continue to watch over him, especially, Father, with the pneumonia that he's now fighting. We pray for the sellers, Danny and Debbie. Um, and we ask, Lord, for their healing, both physically and spiritually and emotionally, uh, that they might uh, not turn away, but uh, return to the work that you have called them to do. We uh, lift up. Uh, Bob Lur's wife's uncle before you again. We thank you for the progress he's making. We pray for Debbie Varney, for Bernice Cordemanche, and uh, Lord, we ask your blessing on these. We thank you, Father, for the progress that Joe's friend Paul has made. Thank you that he is walking again with the help of a cane and pray he'll continue to improve. We pray for Janice and Mike Kelly as they travel today. Keep them safe on these roads, Father. And uh, for Michael and um, his brother and uh, their mom as they travel to Bangor tomorrow for a doctor's appointment. And Lord, we celebrate, along with Paul McGillicuddy, this milestone of 102 years of life. And we pray for his continued health. We lift up uh, the election coming up on Tuesday in Israel and decisions that will be made there. And we pray for our own nation. Uh, there's much going on, Father, that uh, concerns us. Uh, the attack on the police officers in Ferguson, Missouri this week, and uh, the helicopter crash that took the lives of several soldiers and Marines. And we pray your blessing on uh, uh, those families. And Father, for those who have been uh, uh, injured and lives lost in the wake of that typhoon in the Pacific, uh, we pray, Father, for grace and for mercy and for healing. And we pray, Father, for help to arrive, to um, bring, bring aid and assistance to the survivors and those who have lost property and, and homes. Lord, we just uh, bring all of these things before you because you are the God who hears, you are the God who heals, and you are a strong God, mighty to save. And so we present our requests and petitions before you in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we'll ask the ushers to come and receive the morning offer.
Our Heavenly Father, we present these gifts to you this morning. We bring to you your tithe and our gifts and offerings of love because not only do we wish to obey you, but we wish to demonstrate to you our commitment to honor and to love and to obey you. We will not have any other God but you. Receive these gifts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn and greet those nearby. Well, me too. <laughs> If you take the, the praise song book in your hymn in your pew rack, the first one is page 48, the second page 41.
I have confirmation my grandsons are watching this morning. <laughs> Eli and Will, good morning. Uh, I saw a message from their mother, Katrina. Uh, he, he, I think she's talking about Eli, but she might be talking about Will. A little, con little confused seeing Pop on the television. But uh, I'm glad that they're tuned in this morning. I uh, have a missions moment to uh, share with uh, Jennifer. Not a missions moment, but a children's sermon. So if we would have the children come up, and uh, Jennifer's going to take over. Hurry. Desperately need you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we... Um, we have some gorgeous prayer shawls. This is time to remind you all of this ministry. Spring cleaning? No, Ben. <laughs> These are brand new. All right, let me get them quickly. There's, oh, they're so beautiful. Um, Dick. No, you can't get out. A couple of people. Mike, would you come up? Hold some. Bob, would you come up and hold some? There we are. Johnny? There you go. Thank you. Good. And I'll hold one. Hold them up so we can see them, so people can see how pretty they are. Are they beautiful? And this is really pretty, too, with this. There's a couple of ladies. There are actually more, but lately, there have been a couple of women who have been just knitting up a storm this winter, Anna Bradford and Hilda Hughes. And these five have been added to the box. It's underneath the bell table. And we wanted to dedicate them today so that you can help yourself to these. There's a book, and we just all, all we ask of you is that you write in that you've taken a shawl, like the date, and who you're giving it to. And that's all we ask, and you just help yourself. I don't need to know about it. It's a ministry freely given. If you know somebody who could use the comfort and warmth of such a thing, um, my daughter, um, knit one and prayed with her church family for it and then sent it up to me when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So it's a lovely, comforting thing to know. So we wanted all these kids kind of, you know, hug it. All right, give it a hug, Ben. Give it a hug. Come on. You too, Johnny. All right, hug this shawl. Give it a kiss. Well, don't get carried away. <laughs> Dennis, would you come up and just bless these shawls now? We want to uh, add our blessing and benediction to this labor of love. Uh, and uh, in this token of, of care and concern, uh, we want these shawls to be used to bring a blessing, bring a, uh, a gesture of, of thoughtfulness, of caring, of compassion and concern. Thank you to those who have knit these, that is a labor of love. Thank you for doing that. And uh, we desire that these will be used to be a blessing to someone. So that part is up to you. So come and take one, sign in the book. Uh, they sign in the book uh, that they've taken one. Do they say who it's going to? If they choose, if you That's choose nice to say we get that who it's going to go to. So if you know someone who would be touched by a gesture, uh, a lasting gesture that uh, this shawl is a symbol of, of God's embrace, really. And uh, extended through our arms, extended through the knitting needles of some of the ladies in our family. Let's pray together for these tokens of care and concern. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would take this labor, this gesture of kindness and care and concern. That you would use these beautiful shawls to bring uh, mercy and grace, a reassurance of your love and care and concern, and an embrace. That those who use these shawls as they are draped around their shoulders and as they are um, caressed by their cheeks would know that you have touched them, that you have used the hands of your children to bring a blessing to those who receive these gifts. We, 
We ask your blessing on them, and we dedicate these labors of love to your service. In Jesus' name. And Jennifer, thank you for the gentle reminder that I was out of order. You did. You, you caught me right on time. I've been thinking a, a great deal and praying a great deal all through this week about this series of messages in Joshua and, and especially last Sunday's message, which was for me very tough and challenging. And I don't know how you received that, but but a very tough and challenging message. And uh, we're going to continue in the series in Joshua this morning, but I'm going to come at it from a different angle. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me again, and uh, then I'm going to very quickly point out what happens next in the story, and then uh, find our message and application from another part of Scripture. Would you join me in prayer? We do thank you, our Heavenly Father, for the Word of God and its richness. And thank you that when I come to a hard place in your Word, I might find help in understanding from another place in your Word. And so I pray, Father, that you would be our guide, our teacher this morning, and by your Holy Spirit, May the ears of your people hear the words that you have chosen for us to hear today. And not just the words, but the life application. And this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When I planned this series of messages uh, um, several weeks ago now, almost uh, two, three months ago, uh, I knew that we were going to come to the story of Achan and Ai and I knew that right after, the sermon that I would preach right after would be called, We're Back on Track. Last week, we saw that Israel got off track because of disobedience, and judgment came as a result. But the wonderful message of grace and the wonderful message that is at the heart of the gospel, is that when we get off track, there is hope to find our way back. Now, it occurred to me years ago, and I've already said it, I think, at least once since coming here to Holton, but you're going to hear me say it frequently. No matter how far off track you get, there is only ever just one step back into the favor of God, into the plan of God, into the will of God, into the open embrace of God's arms. It is only ever just one step back. But I don't mean to suggest that that's not a difficult step. Because it means that I who have been walking astray must stop and turn around and take one step back but that step is a step of repentance. A, re a step of turning away from my rebellion, turning away from my disobedience, turning away from my sin, and turning back and stepping into the embrace of Jesus again. So how do you get back on track, Israel? Joshua, how do you get back on track? Well, you address what got you off track. You turn from your straying, from your, I have ceased from my wandering and going astray, is the way the hymn writer puts it. I have ceased from my wandering and going astray. Israel last week accepted the judgment of God, the correction, and then we see in the very next chapter, in Joshua chapter 8, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Familiar words, right? From 
Joshua chapter 1, the same message. A lot has happened since Joshua chapter 1. And Joshua now was suddenly uncertain that God was going to bless him anymore because they had really messed up. But you see, the wonderful thing is that God is still ready to bless us. After we've messed up, after we return, God is still ready to continue the work he has begun in us. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 4, one of my favorite verses. Being confident of this very thing, that he, God, who began a good work in you, will be, if you know it, say it with me, will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So God said to Joshua, be courageous, don't be afraid. We're going to go back to Ai. And the, the rest of the chapter, Joshua chapter 8, tells the story of how they went back up against Ai, the city where they had suddenly faced their first defeat. And now God, by the way, I'm not going to read the chapter this morning, but you should. You should go home this afternoon. If you haven't already, read Joshua chapter 8 so you don't fall behind. And see, God has a secret plan. It's like reading a great action and a, the, the script of a great action movie. God has a secret plan for success. We're going to use AI's false confidence against them. We're going to set a trap. We're going to lay an ambush. So read the chapter and see how Israel now reclaims victory after their initial defeat at AI. So uh, that's, that's an assignment I'm leaving with you to read Joshua chapter 8 and see how the story unfolds so that Israel gets back on track. But I want to approach this message this morning from another angle. How does a person get back on track? Once I've left the path of righteousness, there are some texts of Scripture to help us. As I said uh, when we were praying, sometimes... We come up against a, a text in Scripture that's difficult. Maybe it's difficult to understand. Maybe it's not difficult to understand, but difficult to accept, which some of us have been dealing with in the last few weeks. Man, I'm not sure. Comment has, has been made, not by anyone in the room today. I'm not sure that I can say, I really like a God who would do those things. Let me just address that idea for a moment. I'm not sure that I can support a God who would do this, suggests that I'm the one that gets to define what God is like. I will choose which characteristics of God that I want in a God. I'll, I'll deal with my God like I might order from a Chinese restaurant. I'll take one from here, and one from here, I'll have a, a, a buffet smorgasbord of qualities and characteristics that I want in a God. If I was going to design the perfect God, this is what he would look like. You see, I hope, the irony in that statement. If I were going to design a God, what does that sound like? That's idolatry, isn't it? If I'm going to make God in my image, well, that's problematic. I don't get to define what God is like. I don't get to choose from column A or column B. God is God. And he's told us what he's like. And we have to come to terms with that. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7. I'm going to show, with, show you a few verses this morning. Uh, you're welcome to turn there with me or just make notes and, and, check, and uh, check them again later if you want. But I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he, the Lord, will have mercy on him. 
and to our God, for he will freely pardon. You see the lesson in that? This is the prophet Isaiah calling out to a disobedient nation, Israel. And and Israel at the time of Isaiah, God's hand was against Israel again. Why? Because of idolatry. And even in the midst of God's judgment on his people because of idolatry, he continues to send this call. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And let the evil man turn from his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and God will have mercy on him. Let him confess his sin and God will freely pardon him. You know those verses in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We usually claim these verses in the context of a national healing. And rightfully so. This was at the coronation of Solomon. And Solomon said, Lord, if we mess up, would you promise us that when we mess up, if we, get, if we confess, that you will forgive? And so God says, yes. And the, and the words of, of that promise are found in 2 Chronicles 7, verse, starting in verse 13. God says to Solomon, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people. And verse 14 is the familiar one. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. That was God's message through Solomon. Very similar to God's message through Moses and God's message to his people through Joshua and later God's message to his people through Isaiah. When I mess up, when I am disobedient, when I am rebellious, when I go my own way, and when I know that God's hand is no longer with me, but has turned against me, the only thing left for me to do is repent of my disobedience, turn from my sin, and ask God's mercy, and then receive his forgiveness. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And I have two sons, I think, watching right now on the internet. And they, if they were here, would bear witness that uh, they have been on the receiving end of some chastening from their earthly father over the years. But I believe my sons, were they here to testify, would say that my dad, when he disciplined me, always disciplined with my safety in mind, and out of his love for me. That was my motive, son's case, in case that wasn't clear. And if I, who am far from a perfect father, understand that my motive in discipline and chasing and correction for my children is not to harm them, but to keep them safe and bring them into a better place, how much more? Does God who is perfect understand that I who am imperfect need sometimes a firm hand to guide me? When I was a high school student, I sang in the high school chorus. And back then, I don't know if this is true today, maybe Scott would know better than I would, but back then, some of the music that our public school chorus sang was sacred music. And there's one particular piece that we sang when I was, a, when I was in high school chorus 
that I have never forgotten. And every time I come to this text in Scripture, Psalm 103, I remember singing this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. I, I won't, but I could actually sing my part right now because I memorized it and I hear it in my head all the time. In Psalm 103, this is, this is the message that God led me to this week as I was thinking about how do I communicate to this congregation what God wants his people to hear and understand as we have gone along with Joshua and the people of Israel through their experiences. How do I communicate? What would God have me to say to you? And this is the passage that God brought into my mind. Praise the Lord, Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Listen to the benefits that David the psalm writer mentions in this psalm, Psalm 103. Verse 3, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit of destruction and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. That sounds good, doesn't it? God has promised to satisfy your life with good things and renew your youth like the eagles. It makes you think of Isaiah 40, 31, doesn't it? They who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. That's what God wants for you. That's what God wants to do for you. He goes on, verse 6, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. Listen to this, Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger, abounding in love. God doesn't like being angry. God doesn't like thundering from heaven in wrath. How patient are you? Where's the line when you've crossed over from patience to impatience when someone is raising their hand against you, figuratively or literally? On the highway, in the grocery store, on the phone with customer support. <clears throat> verse 9. This might be my favorite verse in the psalm. And maybe because of that line in that choral piece. He will not always chide. Neither will he keep his anger forever. When God does stir himself to act because of my rebellion and disobedience, he's not going to stay mad. He will not always chide. He will not always accuse. And he will not harbor his anger against us forever. Are you familiar with that wonderful chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, that um, the choir sang a section from it this morning? Love is patient, love is kind. One of the things that love is described as a quality of love is love keeps no record of wrong. Does not keep score. Does not, God does not write in his daytimer journal every time I mess up, he's, he's building a case against me. Love keeps no record of wrong. 
He does not treat us, verse 10, as our sins deserve. Boy, aren't you glad that that's true? God does not treat us the way we deserve. He does not repay us according to our iniquities. Why? Verse 11 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Moses, Joshua, the people of Israel, they did not know yet that God loved them. That revelation was coming. When my son Darren, my, my firstborn son Darren, was, was a toddler moving around and discovering things, I mentioned this, I think, in a Bible study this week, he discovered the wall outlet. And, uh, and the way his young, developing mind was thinking, that looks like something to receive something. It's a receptacle. And so his curious mind, inquiring and figuring things out, began to reason out what kind of things will it receive. And I apprehended him in the act of experimentation when he realized that the tip of a table knife would probably fit into one of those openings in the wall receptacle. Fortunately, he did not complete his experiment. He was interrupted. Abruptly. Shockingly. No, not shockingly. Startlingly, with a slap on the hand. My voice just squeaked there. <clears throat> <clears throat> with a slap on the hand. He did not like the slap on the hand. But the slap on his hand spared him from something much worse. And he didn't know. See, he did not know what his father knew. But his father knew that there was danger in the outlet. And that if he proceeded on his course of action, he could get seriously hurt. Now, he wasn't old enough to sit him down and reason with him about that, to explain how things are, to explain alternating current and uh, the conductivity of, uh, sterling, uh, of a stainless steel dinner knife. He wasn't able to reason. But what he did understand was that hurt. That slap on the hand hurt. And I don't want to have that again. I want to avoid that. That's the function of chastening. Small hurt to avoid a greater hurt. Verse 12 of Psalm 103 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed his tra our transgressions from us. And verse 13 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. I'm going to skip down to verse 17. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. I have a beautiful illustration of that here this morning. I did not know when I was preparing this message that Darren and his boys would be tuned in this morning. Yesterday I was doing some work in the house, sorting through papers in one of the boxes that came to Maine with me, and I'm getting rid of stuff that I don't need anymore. And I came across a Father's Day card and a note from my son Darren. And I, I stopped and I sat down and I read the card again and I read the note. And my son Darren referenced in that note that he wrote to me, Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in, a way, in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. 
And I sat there in the chair yesterday reflecting on what that message meant to me. Something that I saved for a number of years now since, since he gave that card to me. I've never forgotten it. And that is an illustration to me of what that verse says. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. It's so much better to walk with God than to try to stand against him. So much better. Because when you oppose God, you're going to suffer and those who come after you are going to suffer. But when you walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on your life. And there is a benefit both to you and to your children and to their children and so on. I'm not bragging about this, but I learned this some years ago, and I'm pretty excited about it. I've, I've learned, I always knew that there was a strong Christian witness on my father's side of the family, but it wasn't until just a few years ago that I learned that my mother's side of the family also has a strong Christian witness. And uh, on my mother's side of the family, my mother's father, Carlton Shaver, who, whose name I have, uh, it was a direct descendant, direct descendant, 12 generations back from Obadiah Holmes. Now, that name might not mean anything to you, but if you're a student of history, if you're a student of Baptist history, you will be interested to know that Obadiah Holmes was the second pastor of the first Baptist church in America, Providence, Rhode Island. He followed Roger Williams as the second pastor of the First Baptist Church. And that is my great, 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 12 times, 13 times grandfather. There is a blessing for your children and for their children and for their children. When you commit your way to the Lord, the blessing continues down through the generations. On my father's side of the family, my father had two brothers, an older brother and a younger brother. Both of them became pastors. They're both still living, both retired now, but both of my uncles on my father's side are pastors. My father was a funeral director. Two to get ready, one to go. <laughs> the way it worked. My, my, my generation... Uh, my older brother's a pastor. Two of my cousins are pastors. Three of my cousins have been involved in vocational Christian ministry as teachers, Christian school teachers. It's the family business. Literally. It's the family business. And that, is a, that is a legacy of parents and grandparents and great-grandparents who've committed their way to the Lord and prayed for their children. My, my grandmother, Lucille, who you'll hear me talk about from time to time, stern woman. But she was a praying woman, and she prayed for me every day of my life until she died. Now maybe she's still praying for me more directly, and her other grandchildren who have gone into Christian service. God is a God who is faithful to his promise, and if you are faithful to God, you will be blessed and your children and their children will be blessed. That's a good deal. That's a good investment. If you want to leave something for your children, leave them property, leave them money, fine. But what will really bless them is if you leave them with a godly legacy. And that will extend to your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and so on. Let's get back on track. 
let's turn from whatever it is that has taken us off course, individually and collectively, and let's say one step about face and step into the arms of God. Seek him while he may be found. One last verse from Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they all will know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Step into the arms of God and receive his forgiveness and receive the blessing. He has promised never to bring it up again. He will not remind you of those days when you were disobedient. He will not say to you, see, I told you so. He will not say to you, well, see, there you go again. If you step in repentance into the arms of God and be forgiven, he will remember your sin no more. Let's pray together. We turn and face you, Father, this morning. Glad to be back on track. Both Joshua in Israel and we here. We are grateful, Father, that you have said to us that we might seek you while you can be found. And we will find you if we seek you with all of our hearts. And when we turn in repentance and step into your arms, you forgive us. You will not keep your anger against us forever. You will forgive us and never again remember our acts of disobedience and defiance and rebellion and selfishness. We turn and face you, Father, in humility, we reject our own sinfulness and receive from you your healing and forgiveness with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take your hymnal and turn to number 511? And as our closing hymn, we'll stand and sing, Now I Belong to Jesus, number 511. Let's stand together as we sing. Oh,
receive the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.